today is February 20th, uh, 2015. My name is Jerry Gill, and I'm interviewing uh, Bud Samant in the Oklahoma Conference Ministry Center in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. This interview will be filed in the archives of the Oklahoma Conference of the United Methodist Church and in the archives of the Oklahoma History Center. It will also be available online on the website of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Bud, can you share some personal information about yourself, you know, where you grew up, and your family, maybe your tribal affiliation? Yes, uh, I'm a member of the Kiowa Tribe of Oklahoma. I'm a full-blood Kiowa member. Uh, I grew up in a small community called Mears, Oklahoma. I attended high school at Elgin, Oklahoma. Uh, attended school at Cameron Junior College, Oklahoma City University, uh, Southwestern State University, and University of Minnesota. Uh, I'm the youngest of 10 children. Uh, my father was a farmer. Uh, my mother was a, a housemaker all her life. Uh, an interesting thing about my mom and my dad is that <clears throat> their marriage was arranged. And uh, they uh, were married, uh, I think, somewhere in the area of 65 years before my father passed away. Uh, my mother. My mother uh, lived to be uh, 101 years of age. Uh, my mother was born uh, at a Sundance, Kiowa Sundance, in Carnegie, Oklahoma, in, uh, in 2000, uh, 1905. No, uh, well, she, whatever 100 years is less from 2005 is. Um, my father was born <coughs> at the Anadarko. Uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs Agency, uh, where my uh, grandmother and father were both employed uh, 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 of the ten children, five of us remain uh, today. Please, can you talk a little bit about your work history, professional career, after you got your education completed? Uh, when I graduated from Oklahoma City University, <coughs> my first job um, uh, was uh, being a teacher and a coach at Mustang High School. Uh, from there I went to uh, do the same thing at Cash High School in Comanche County. Uh, while I was there I uh, uh, gained employment with the Oklahoma State Department of Education, uh, which uh, was the what they call the uh, Indian Education Section where we entered upon a uh, program that they started that uh, gave counseling services to young men and women in the high schools and counties that we worked. So I worked in Comanche County <laughs> with all the high schools and among the Indian population there, uh, working to keep uh, young children in school and helping them finish high school. Uh, from there, uh, I came up here to the city and worked in our main office out of the State Department of Education uh, left and went back to uh, graduate school at the University of Minnesota. From there I uh, applied to a number of colleges and universities here in Oklahoma uh, to uh, go to work and Oklahoma City University hired me in 1972. And I worked there uh, until 2001 whenever I uh, retired. Well, when I first came to OCU, I was I was a, a assistant professor of education, teaching in our uh, teacher education programs. Uh, during that time, I uh, 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 taught various classes, foundation classes uh, for teachers. Uh, then uh, I became dean of our ed school, which included education and um, and uh, uh, the social sciences. Uh, worked there for a while, um, eventually gained my full professorship here at OCU. Uh, was named the uh, <coughs> Director of Athletics in 1987 and uh, continued to do that until I retired. Uh, in addition to that, I served as University Marshal for, the number, for a number of years here at Oklahoma City University. 
uh, I uh, <coughs> uh, helped incorporate a uh, special program for uh, American Indian students, a recruitment program and a counseling program here where our purpose was to go out and uh, recruit <coughs> American Indians to come to school at Oklahoma City University. Uh, we expanded that from an undergraduate program to a graduate program and into the law school where we recruited students for all those areas and uh, proved to be a very successful program. Uh, when, uh, when I retired, the program discontinued, never, never uh, continued again. Uh, I uh, represented Oklahoma City University uh, twice by uh, uh, being an exchange teacher, both in, uh, in the Republic of China, Taiwan, and uh, the uh, uh, country of, of mainland China. Uh, went there both places twice, uh, taught classes in uh, universities there. It was a part of an exchange program that brought students from those two countries here at OCU to study. You talked about being athletic director. Can you carry about those banners and hanging in the gymnasium, the banners? Well, there's a bunch of banners in the uh, uh, Abe Lemons gymnasium over here that uh, represent the success of our athletic programs. Uh, when I started uh, as athletic director at OCU, we never won, had never won a national championship of any sport. And uh, through the help of our then president, Jerry Walker, uh, we went out and ventured into uh, uh, programs that was designed to try to create, you know, those kinds of programs, and it turned out well. We uh, ended up, by the time I left, I think we had, uh, we had won 19 national championships in various sports at Oklahoma City University, and it continues now. They still do it. But changing direction just a little bit, and talking about the history of the, the Kiowa tribe, when were the Commonwealth settled on the reservation land in Oklahoma? You know what? I don't know the exact date. Uh, maybe 1887? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, it came about through a treaty called Treaty of Medicine Lodge. And uh, that was the uh, point in time that uh, the Comanche, Apache, and Kiowa leaders uh, met in Medicine Lodge, Kansas, and signed an agreement with the United States government that they would take allotments and that they would take a parcel of land to live on. Uh, the land was owned jointly by the three tribes, still is. Any land that's not actually belongs to the tribe was, was, uh, still belongs to the three tribes. And so uh, my grandfather, my great, wait a minute, my great great grandfather, uh, his name was Stumbling Bear. He was one of the last original war chiefs of the Kiowa tribe. Uh, his, his notoriety came from the fact that he went out and prove, proved himself in war. Uh, and, and we have record that he did some things that probably we don't want to talk about. But uh, in the end, he proved to be uh, uh, worthy of, uh, of uh, what he uh, was and what he did, and, and we descend from that. Uh, uh, the relationship, kin-wise, is that my grandmother, Virginia, who is my father's mother, uh, at the age of six, when the uh, tribal people took allotments, uh, they uh, chose the younger uh, uh, younger children to go to uh, boarding school. And at that time in history, the only boarding school that existed in this country was Carlisle Indian School, which is located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. My grandmother, at the age of six, was sent to Carlisle Indian School to go to school. Uh, at the time she went to uh, Carlisle, she could speak no English. Uh, had never been away from home in her life, uh, but went there and stayed there for 12 years. Uh, that's the bad part of the story. 
the good part of the story is that when she came back, she knew how to read and write and speak English. And uh, she uh, got her name Virginia when she went to that school. She didn't have an English name when she left here, but when she came back, she was named Virginia Stumbling Bear. And so that was how we identified her from that point on in our lives and still do today. Uh, her value uh, came from uh, being able to interpret uh, a missionary by the name of J.J. Methan who is very instrumental in, in uh, uh, spreading the word of Methodism among our people, uh, had been among our people prior to her coming back. And even though the tribal members could not hear or understand anything he was saying because he was speaking in English, which, of which no one knew, uh, he still sit on the side of camps where Kaibas were, and I'm sure Comanches and Apaches would be included in that because they were also in the area, and uh, preached. And uh, I, always, I always compare it to a preacher standing on a sidewalk on, on the street when you drive by, uh, standing out there uh, preaching at his uh, heart's best and most people paying no attention to him, uh, continue to drive on by him, I think. That's kind of what happened, according to my dad. You know, they would they tolerated him and they let him do it, and and uh, really didn't uh, inquire of anything because they they didn't know how. But when my grandmother came back, she uh, could be of help to him, and he learned that she was there, and uh, began to hunt for her. And so J.J. Methan. Uh, from what I'm told, uh, went from one Kiowa village to the other uh, uh, and would stand out in front of the village and shout out in English, Virginia Stumbling Bear, if you're in the camp, would you please come out? Uh, even though she could hear him, she was afraid to come out initially because she thought that there was somebody who was coming to take her back to Pennsylvania. And of course, she didn't want to go back. Uh, but in time, her trust changed, and uh, she did identify herself to uh, to him and uh, served as an interpreter for him. Uh, and of course, a lot of other things. She did a lot of interpretation about other things, legal matters, social matters for uh, the people uh, during that time. So that was her uh, benefit to that. Stumbling Bear. Although, like I said, he was a war chief, uh, was uh, was uh, uh, converted to become a peace chief. Uh, he and uh, a chief named Kicking Bird, uh, they were cousins, and they were both chiefs at the time. And uh, uh, Stumbling Bear, one of Stumbling Bear's children, was very ill, and they never really lost their sense of rivalry. Uh, with the army and with the government officials, even though uh, they were brought to a reservation and were uh, were contained within a, a geographical area, mainly down in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which is in Lawton, Oklahoma, they uh, they remained at odds and had a lot of uh, conflicts with the commanding general there at Fort Sill, who was who was trying to get them to behave themselves uh, and to stop thinking about warring and, and uh, causing problems. And, and among the seven Kiowa chiefs at that time, three of them, the younger ones, they continued to go across the Red River and raid wagon trains, even though they were supposed to be staying within that confined boundary. And, uh, and so they uh, had a hard time containing them. Uh, and, and at that time, Texas was a republic and uh, the Texas Rangers could, cross, could chase them, but once they crossed the Red River, they couldn't come across that, that line. And so they kind of had refuge in a way. But when they came across the line, the commanding general of Fort Sill was required to take care of whatever kind of problems that came there. So there was a lot of animosity and a lot of, uh, of conflict during that time. But uh, one of uh, uh, Stumbling Bear's children was very ill 
and uh, the commanding general sent the uh, post doctor to his teepee and uh, uh, administered some medication to that child and that child got okay. And I'm told at that point in time, Sunling Bear decided, hey, it's time for us to maybe uh, change our way of life and, and start living together and so forth. And, uh, and he became what is known as a peace chief. And from that point in time in his life, he, he advocated that we move into a new era and new direction. Uh, I think when my grandmother, Virginia, uh, came back from Carlisle, it convinced him even more that uh, the young people uh, needed to start thinking about a new life and, and a new way of life uh, that would be different from the traditional warlike uh, life of the Kiowa people. And education became an important part of what that, uh, that meant. Could you expand on that a little bit about the way of life? How did it, moving to the reservation, how did it change the way of life for Kiowas? Well, Kiowas were very nomadic when it got to tribe and, and, and uh, rising to the top echelon, you know, we, we say, I remember growing up as a young boy, everybody wanted to be the president of the United States. Um, that was what everybody said you should be. That would be the highest position and the highest uh, respected thing a person could be and do. Uh, if you wanted to uh, use an analogy among the Kiowas, becoming a chief would be of, of equal. And uh, in order to become a chief, you had to go through a series of things that would allow you to do that. Uh, as a young man, you would have to be uh, like most young people do today, have chores, taking care of the horses, feeding the horses. Uh, being a stable person, then as a young person, uh, uh, hoping to be chosen to go on a war party because that was how you became the best, highest ranked person in our tribe. Uh, you had to go to war, you had to go fight the enemy. And in those days, uh, the enemy was the Ute people up in the Utah, Colorado area, and the Navajo people, I'm told. And so uh, uh, daily life consisted of, uh, of uh, planning to be uh, the best warrior you could. And being the best warrior you could meant going out and challenging someone in a way that uh, you could survive and uh, take your prisoners or take your kills or whatever you had to do. And when that happened, then you gained status. And uh, among the uh, Kiowa people at that time, the four best warriors were given the right to be the top echelon of government. So everybody wanted to move in that direction. Uh, even growing up as young people, you can uh, imagine that one of the goal, if anybody said, what do you want to be someday? I want to be a big warrior. I want to be the best warrior we have in our tribe. And so they went through that. So my grandfather went through that. and. Uh, uh, he he uh, un undoubtedly did some bad deeds during his life, uh, but that was a way of life. And uh, uh, but in the end, he uh, he uh, decided that they he wanted to live in peace, and he wanted the Kiowa people to live in peace. Not not all Kiowas turned out to be peace peace you know peace chiefs. Uh, you know some of them never did change. Kiowa and the other Plains tribes you mentioned, Apache, Comanche, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Wichita, Caddo, uh, they were placed under the jurisdiction of the Indian Mission Conference of the United Methodist Church. How were the Plains tribes and the five tribes, you know, the Cherokees, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Seminoles, Creeks, how were they different from, from the five tribes and did that create problems being under the same jurisdiction? <laughs> well, when, when, uh, when the government made treaties with the five tribes, as I understand it, uh, all of what is now Oklahoma was given to those tribes running from uh, east to west. And uh, the area that uh, became the uh, Kiowa, Comanche, and Apache Reservation, which is the southwest part of the state, was a part of what piece of property that I think was originally given to the Chickasaws. And, uh, and uh, when uh, the five tribes came, uh, 
uh, all the tribes on the west side, which, which are known as the Western tribes, they call them the Western tribes, those are the plains groups, uh, uh, starting with the Osage, coming down to the Pawnee, Oto, uh, Cheyenne Arapaho, uh, uh, all the tribes that ran along there that were not five tribes. Uh, still claim the land aboriginally. Uh, they, they didn't accept anyone else's agreements or treaties that took up the space that they had traditionally lived in. And so having traditionally lived in the area that we were in, uh, we fought anybody who came in there, even though if you look at a, a piece of legal paper, it belonged to someone else but it didn't belong to them according to our people. And so uh, what happened is that the five tribes never really penetrated uh, into the uh, uh, western part of our state during that time because they were, they were attacked and they, fought. They, uh, they were fought by those people who were living there. And of course, uh, what happened and how our reservation eventually came about uh, was a result of the Civil War. Uh, the uh, area of Oklahoma, which contained all of the tribes at the time, uh, sort of became a buffer state between Kansas, which was a Union state, and Texas, which was a Southern state. And uh, the five tribes had basically settled pretty well into their area, the uh, eastern part of the state. Uh, the animosity between the western tribes and the eastern tribes settled down because they didn't try to penetrate any further than those tribes wanted them to. But <clears throat> eventually all of the five tribes uh, joined the south uh, because the north didn't really live up to their treaties, which included annuities for the land that they gave up in the east to come here all the services that the government was supposed to, because they didn't want those services to become a part of the South in case they, ch they chose to go with the South. And so the South was enticing them to join the South, and, they, and they, one of the things they did is they promised them that they would give them statehood. And so eventually, when the North had kept all of their uh, 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 supplies from the tribes, uh, they uh, all eventually joined the South. Well, after the war was over with and the North won, the government came back among the tribes and said, you, you uh, bad boys, you went against us and joined the South. Uh, they never apologized because they kept everything that belonged to them away from them. But they said, we're going to punish you for joining the South now. And there's going to be one of the two things you're going to have to do. You're going to have to give your slaves either 20 acres of land or citizen in your tribe. You're going to have to grant right of ways to railroads. And you're going to have to give up the western part of the lands that the, the other tribes are living on. And that's how the Kiowa Comanche and Apache Reservation came to be. You talked earlier about efforts of the church at, uh, and the government to assimilate Plains Indians into white culture. Uh, missionary uh, uh, church supported boarding schools was one of those obviously uh -huh. what, what other things that what was uh, that clashed with traditional Kiowa spirituality and values having to be assimilated into white culture? well there there's a there's a strange kind of way of looking at it and in, in my way uh, uh, most of the times when people talk about the Kiowas and the Plains tribes that were warlike, Cheyenne Arapaho and, and Comanches and Kiowas, Sioux, uh, they, they talk more about the war kind of things and, and attacking wagon trains and killing people and, and that kind of thing. And that did happen. Uh, uh, you know, you can't argue justification on either side because both sides thought what they were doing was the right thing to do. Uh, uh, Kiowa, the Kiowa way of life is a, is a very, very good way of life. Uh, it's, it's a very communal way of life. Take care of each other, uh, share with one another, 
love one another, uh, uh, believe that there was a Almighty, even though we they didn't recognize it to be the same Almighty that we do in a Christian world. Uh, they knew something was happening that was all powerful. Uh, that was one of the reasons why I think uh, the sun became such an important part of most Indian cultures' life. The the respect of the sun, because they saw what was happening. It was making things happen. The weather, something was creating that that uh, that. Uh, uh, they didn't understand, but they knew something more powerful than them was causing it. Uh, and, and so a lot of the uh, belief was spiritual in, ma in, in general. Uh, uh, and, uh, and they, but they weren't practicing Christianity the way we do today. Uh, I, always, I always say that I think one of the reasons why our people, the Kiowa people, uh, accepted Christianity uh, was that when the missionaries start coming among them, they, they came in there and said, you need to love one another, you know, God's love is important, you need to love one another, you need to care about one another, and you take care of one another. And they said, you know, where's this guy coming from? We already do that. You know, the only thing I think that was lacking in their culture was that they weren't aware that Jesus Christ came to earth and, and uh, went through the uh, life that he did. But once they learned that, I think they kind of thought, well, that makes a little bit of sense. That, 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 that's not anything that, you know, is something that we should fear. And I think, pers I really believe that a lot, of, uh, a lot of them changed their way of life to Christianity because of that. Uh, the other thing I always tell people whenever I uh, speak to groups and, and talk to uh, individuals is that, one of the things that Christianity, I think, has, has done and has been helpful to us, in, me individually, uh, other members of tribal groups around the country, is that it gave us the opportunity to forgive. You know, there, if you study history, history books are full of atrocities, bad things, bad deeds, unfair things, unkind things that were done to American Indians in the conquest of them. And uh, you, can, you can get angry if you read a book and read about some of the things that happened. Uh, there's, a, there's a book that was written by uh, uh, a lady uh, about how Carlisle Institute came to being. And <clears throat> when Carlisle Institute's football teams uh, became athletic enough to compete with the other colleges, how they cheated them out of every one of every game they did. They wouldn't let them win. They couldn't stand to let them win because if they won, it meant that they were as good as they were or better than they were. And so the culture of, of Europe, you know, uh, needs to be examined sometimes because that was the culture that we were fighting at the time that, uh, that uh, was representing them in the way they did. And so, and so you can get angry real, uh, real uh, quick. Uh, I told my, I told my son-in-law about that book. He's not an Indian, and he read it. And I got tickled because whenever I talked to him after he read it, he was so mad. He was so mad about the way they treated him. And and so, Christianity through the teachings of, of Christ and, and understanding the Bible, I think maybe the, the best value it ever had for us was that it gave us the chance to forgive. And uh, that's good. Christianity and, and the United Methodist Church, in one sense, divided the Kiowa tribe, those who accepted uh, Christianity and Methodism, those who did not. Uh, was this a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> well, <clears throat> when, when the missionaries first came among our people, the Kiowa, uh, I, I don't know about any other tribe, but J.J. Uh, Methon, uh, they brought with them a very hard sell way of, of looking at it. Uh, their, their sell was, you know, it's either heaven or hell, no in between. Uh, uh, you change your way, you, you don't worship idols, uh, you worship you know, you worship God, 
and uh, and whatever whatever you are or whatever you believe or uh, however you go about your life, uh, if it isn't the kind that Christianity uh, requires you to do, you're going to go to hell. Uh, and for that reason, they uh, they looked upon the practices and rites of our tribe as bad. And so when missionaries came in there, they actually uh, formed a, a, a split in the way of thinking among those who wanted to stay traditional in their ways, practice the Kiowa traditional ways, which weren't bad. When you look at it from, from that standpoint, uh, uh, and, and continue to do that uh, by saying that they're bad people because they don't believe in God. And, and they're pagans because they're worshiping something other than doing that. They don't go to church. Uh, they don't practice uh, the religion, and so uh, what happened in growing up in my uh, in my uh, young lifetime is that those who accepted Christianity, uh, in fact, accepted the uh, the turn away from the way of life of a Kiowa person. Didn't mean they didn't speak Kiowa anymore. Or didn't mean they didn't do the things that Kiowa, but. I always tell everybody the best example that I know of is my grandfather, my mother's uh, father. Uh, one of the traditions among the Kiowa people at that time was that they could have two wives. And in most cases, the Kiowa tradition was that they, their wives were sisters. Uh, so uh, that means that you, if you were a Kiowa, you would be married to your wife's sister too. Uh, but but my grandfather uh, and my two grandmothers, I call them, one my uh, 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 maternal grandfather, grandmother, um, bore her, my grandfather five children each. Both wives bore, uh, uh, had five children from him. They all lived together in the same house. They grew up together. They didn't recognize each other except that they were full brothers and sisters. They both looked at their uh, uh, real mothers as, uh, as mothers. Uh, but when uh, my grandfather uh, was encountered and, uh, and decided to accept Christianity, uh, he was told that he had to give up one of his wives or he would go to hell. And so at that time uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our lives, my grandmother, my mother's mother, she uh, moved into our home and uh, lived in our home until she passed away. Uh, the other uh, sister lived with uh, my grandfather uh, until they uh, passed away. So, so, you know, there's two things that, that I think results from that. You, you have to have a pretty strong commitment to give yourself to, to the Lord to do things like that far more probably than I would ever have. And, uh, and uh, all of them gave themselves, uh, became Christians, even my grandmother. But like I was saying, you know, the chance to forgive is an important part of all that. Uh, she, never, she never held any animosity against anyone. Matter of fact, she would go back and visit her sister in the home that she lived in and occasion her, my uh, other grandmother would come to our home and visit her because they were sisters. Uh, that never went away, and so, and so, uh, uh, the church, at that time, as they were being established, uh, most of the tribal people at that time could not speak English, and so bringing a uh, English-speaking pastor into a church didn't make any sense. So what they did at that time is they went out and tried to find individuals who felt the call to come and be preachers, and those became the first preachers. Uh, very, uh, very, very wonderful people. Very, very uh, committed people. Uh, the second generation of, of, uh, of the American Indians who accepted Christianity. I'm a third generation uh, uh, of, of those who first accepted Christianity. Uh, they didn't have any uh, theological training, of course, so they just spoke whatever they felt like speaking. Uh, but it was the same message. 
you came to church because if you didn't come to church, you would go to hell. And uh, if you uh, attended any other event like uh, the Kiowa's Health, then you, were, you weren't being Christian. And so that was kind of the, the manner that we were all brought up in. And my mom and dad accepted that also. Uh, they, uh, they encouraged us to stay away from powwows, for example, or any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, uh, cultural event because in their minds, those people were bad people. And the thing is, you don't want to go around bad people. So, so we, we, we kind of believed it to some degree, but we didn't believe it totally because when we would go to birthday dinners among the tribal people or go to any kind of, uh, of uh, a gathering that brought everybody together, not at church, I mean, the young kids that I was playing with were kids who were children of those who went to the powwows all the time and never went to church. And so, you know, I think over a period of time, we began to see that there's, there's, no, there's not anything bad about them. You know, they're, they're good people. Uh, why, why are we condemning them? Why are we putting them into a, uh, uh, a uh, cage that, uh, you know, gives them a bad name? But my mother and father continued to believe strongly that what the preaching was giving them was, was the right right thing uh, until finally when we got old enough to uh, make up our own minds we started participating in powwows you know I, I started dancing uh, my brother started dancing uh, we we uh, we uh, uh, joined Indian uh, gourd clans and and dance uh, their ceremonies that they'd have every year and so finally my mom and dad who participated before Christianity, but then stopped when they were became, quote, Christians. They knew what was going on there. They started supporting us because we, when we camped, they would practice the Kiowa tradition and saying, if my children are out there doing something, I'm there to help them do that. And they'd camp and my mom would cook make sure we had something to eat. My dad would put up tents, make sure we had a place to sleep during that time. And so they began to lessen their belief, I think, that they had to stay away from those kinds of activities. And uh, they found out that there may be as much religious, spiritual activity that goes on at one of the cultural things that, that they might have seen in church. Everybody treated them good, Everybody, they were Kiowas. They treated them well. They loved them. They cared for them. Made them feel good. Made them re feel respected. And they said, hey, maybe this isn't really the way it is whenever uh, you go to one of these kind of things. Well, anyway, in time, we all changed and we all began to participate. We still do. My grandkids dance. They've been dancing since they could walk. Uh, we all go to powwows. We all participate in things, but we still all go to church. And we do them both now. But speaking of that church, well, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, your uh, church you belong to has a, a strong history in the in the Kiowa community? Uh, yeah, I was raised. I was raised. Yeah, I was raised in Mount Scott Kiowa United you know, Methodist Church. Uh, what, what was that like, Bud? What, can you kind of share you know what a typical Sunday would be like and, and, and what the liturgy was, et cetera? Uh, Mount Scott Kiowa Church. Uh, was established uh, in uh, 1905. It celebrated its 100th anniversary in 2005. It, it's maintained its existence all that time. When, uh, when the Kiowa people took allotments, they were already living on the land. And so when the government says, now you can have 160 acres of your own land, they just took the land that they were already living on. Most of them had homes on them and everything, and, and all the relatives and family all took adjoining allotments so that a family uh, all encompassed a pretty large area of, of property. And so when they started, uh, when they started uh, 
deciding to build churches, uh, those people were the ones who established those churches. And uh, the charter members of the, of the church at Mount Scott, uh, Kiowa, uh, I would say 75% of them are my kinfolk. Uh, and uh, that's how the church starts, kind of a family church. All the families that lived in that area, we were all pretty much kin to one another, uh, had close ties uh, of various kinds, uh, all went to that church. And, and I think that was true in a lot of churches in that area. I know the Comanche Church, that's not too far from us. Uh, the same thing happened there, uh, the families of that area. and and. It was called Kiowa, Mount Scott Kiowa, because the only language that was spoken was Kiowa. I mean, any other tribal member who came there might as well, you know, come there and not even understand what was being said because everything was being said in Kiowa at that time. And uh, uh, that church was built out of some native stone that, uh, that family members uh, haul from the hills nearby and, and through, uh, through manual labor of all the people put that church together and, and uh, it now it's on the historical register uh, of churches. Uh, but uh, church sermons lasted, I told you earlier that the ministers were people who were called. Uh, they studied, I'm sure they studied the Bible to the best they could, uh, but the, a, a typical church service when I was growing up as a young boy, uh, time wasn't a factor. Uh, Indian people get laughed at because they say there's a thing known as Indian time. We laugh at ourselves now. Uh, but there wasn't any reason to worry about time because uh, during those days uh, they learned that Sundays was a day of worship, nothing else. I mean, don't worry about what time or don't worry about all that kind of stuff. I mean, you come to worship and, and however long it takes you to do that, you do it. And so uh, a service typically started out uh, with Sunday school. Uh, then when, when the service started, there was always a testimonial portion to the service. Uh, at that time, a person had to get up and, and testify that they were a sinner, that they weren't any good, uh, anything that they could think of that was bad, and asked to be forgiven. And so uh, a preacher normally would sing, they'd sing Indian songs, He'd say, anybody want to testify? Uh, nobody got up, he'd sing another Indian song. Uh, they'd sing Indian songs until somebody finally decided, you know, hey, I'll get up and testify to get this thing over with, maybe. And they would go through that whole process. And when that was finished, then the sermon began. That might be one o'clock in the afternoon. And so the preacher would then deliver his sermon. And his effort was to get people to come to the altar. So how long do I have to do that to get the people to get up here to the altar? And so he would say he would do his sermon and he would have altar call. If nobody came, he'd sing songs. He'd continue to preach until finally somebody would come to the altar. And when enough came, I guess he would decide that it was okay for today. And that would end the sermon. Well, it could be three or four o'clock in the afternoon whenever that happened. That was a typical Sunday. But nobody worried about it. Nobody got anxious about it because Sunday was a day of worship. I think we'll to go back to that now and try that again. But the, the current uh, repentance and reconciliation you movement. You want water? The, the current repentance and reconciliation movement in the church, are you familiar with that? Uh, Somewhat. It calls for the United Methodist Church to acknowledge past injustices to its Native American community. And in, in your opinion, what were the negative consequences of church missionary efforts and injustices? What was the negative impact of missionary activities on, say, the Kiowa tribe? 
You mean how do they feel about somebody like J.J. Methan? Yeah, and, and, and did they, they, what changes did it create in their culture and their values in their life that, and some things that, pain and, and that it caused them in, from being members of the Methodist Church? I, I, I grew up never hearing any of the, what I call full bloods, okay? Uh, people who live the life, experience the life in the old ways. Telling me that what happened ought to deserve an apology. Now, you know, that you, 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 know you can get into that concern too. Uh, I, I'm not sure why the Methodist Church wants to apologize, but if they do, then that's their choice. Uh, in, in my growing up, I never heard any preaching or any of the, anybody from my generation back say that the Methodist Church ought to apologize for anything. Uh, I think that's, that's a modern thought. Uh, I think we live in a world now where we worried about hurting each other's feelings so much that uh, that you know it it touches our conscience in a different way than maybe way a long time ago. Uh, I mean, yes, there were there maybe were some atrocities. Uh, uh, the Methodist Church can be criticized if somebody wants to criticize them for the way they went about converting Kiwas to Christianity. But I think you're missing the point of Christianity in its totality when you want to do that. Being a Christian offers you a chance to forgive. But if you hold that in your hold that in yourself or, for, and, and you don't release it through forgiveness, then something's wrong, I don't know. But, uh, I mean, it, you know, in, in my way of thinking, if the church wants to apologize for anything, they, that's their right to do that, uh, whatever it may be. But you, you worship it, it Angie Smith. In Angie church. Smith, yeah, Angie Smith Memorial. What, what, what can you tell me about your church? What? What can you tell me about the Angie Smith Church? Well, it's it's a city church formed because uh, uh, historically American Indians lived in rural areas. Okay, uh, offering an opportunity for uh, self-existence through uh, employment wasn't very available. Uh, if you study uh, areas up in uh, the reservations in uh, South Dakota, for example, uh, they're still having that same problem today. It's a very remote, very rural area. Uh, the only way you can find work is to leave your home and, and go somewhere else and do that. Uh, but in order to do that among uh, our people and, and many people around the country uh, was to uh, uh, go through what they called a relocation program among adults. And that was is to locate them and identify them and uh, find them a job in a metropolitan area uh, where they could work, uh, take care of their family and so forth. And that happened among a lot of people, a lot of tribes. Kiwas uh, uh, ended up in uh, Los Angeles and Dallas, Wichita, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, uh, those kind of places among uh, other uh, tribal people who also came here. Uh, and so uh, what happened then is that you saw a little bit of migration of various uh, uh, American Indians to the urban areas, primarily to work. Well when they got to the urban areas for whatever reason uh, they didn't attend uh, services because there were no Indian churches in the area uh, and uh, 
most of them chose not to participate in the non-Indian churches. And so in order to combat that, uh, the idea for having urban churches came about among uh, the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. And so uh, churches like uh, Mary Lee Clark and Angie Smith, Billy Hooten, uh, Norman First Church in Norman, uh, they were all established so that the uh, Indian people who were in the city could come together. And that sort of was a breakaway from the old traditional churches where only one tribe went to that church. Uh, the churches here in the city became a mixture of a lot of different tribes. Uh, in, in, at Angie Smith, we have a number of different tribes that come there. Uh, I know uh, every Sunday we sang a Ponca hymn, we sang a Kiowa hymn, we sang a Choctaw hymn. Uh, we sang a Cheyenne hymn, uh, sometimes a Comanche hymn, uh, and those are representative of those families who came here during that time and are still here. Our preachers are basically, everything's in English. We, we very seldom do anything in, in the native language other than sing our native hymns. Uh, and uh, they're, uh, uh, our preacher at Angie Smith right now is a non-Indian. Uh, and but is a is seminary trained to some degree and we're getting more seminary trained uh, students there's programs to help those who want to become ministers so it's it's moving you know in that direction which uh, which is, is accepted no one uh, I know of is complaining about the direction that it's moving but are, are you uh, what's your opinion about the, the current status of Native American churches in the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, and, and are you concerned about the future of Native American churches in OIMC? Yeah, I, th I think I think the biggest concern is is the um, uh, those that are out in in the rural areas. Uh, it, it isn't it isn't it affecting Mount Scott Kiowa, which is in a very rural area uh, northwest of Lawton, Oklahoma because uh, uh, housing developments have sprang up in those areas. And uh, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, uh, people, Indian people, who uh, uh, came from the community that I come from uh, have access to uh, employment like Fort Sill Military Base. Uh, a lot of them became teachers once they were educated uh, and, and so forth and all chose to, to stay in that area and raise their families. Now the number isn't as high uh, and, and uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, probably would be less than it was back whenever I went when there were lots of them living at that time. Uh, but I can imagine there are places in the state where we have churches that uh, that uh, don't have as many people to depend on, and I think what happens there is that it's like anything else; it's a uh, uh, it's a financial crush on the church in order to to do that. Uh, the lack of ministers, I think, sometimes hurts uh, because I think ministers sometimes have to uh, have to. Uh, uh, share Sundays with various churches where you don't get a minister every Sunday. Uh, Mount Scott Kaiba went through that at one time where, uh, matter of fact, it still may be where, uh, you know, lack of ministers creates a need for having two churches in that ministry rather than one. Uh, uh, the American Indians have always been uh, uh, financially uh, I don't know what the poverty status is, but the socioeconomic status of American Indians don't uh, give them the uh, power to, you know, to support a church through their offerings and their tithes. Uh, uh, when, as I understand it, and David Wilson may be able to better uh, give you better information, but the way I understand it, whenever uh, churches were asked to become more independent, and, 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 and you know the history of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, it was a mission at one time, a mission of the Oklahoma Conference. And at that time, uh, they pretty much took care of their needs. And there wasn't a lot of demand on an individual's income. 
that they had, whatever amount it might be. Uh, and so uh, it wasn't quite as hard to, to maintain. But now that the requirement on a person's income to support those churches uh, became become more and more relevant in terms of keeping the church going, uh, whatever the socioeconomic status of the Methodist church is, well, all of that plays into it. And uh, I think that's going to be uh, something that's going to be difficult to maintain. Uh, and the other is is that we, we all worked hard to get the younger people educated, but by educating them, they couldn't stay where they were because there was no work there. So they've all had to move out to other areas. And uh, uh, it hurts churches in the rural areas when those people leave and, and don't come back. Uh, one, one of the things that also happens in terms of, of that and as, as, as you uh, move ahead, uh, my children, when they were young, was raised in Mount Scott. That's when they first started. They attended those services and, and experienced all those kinds of ways that Indian churches do things. Uh, but once they, once they got out of college and got jobs, uh, they moved and, and, and their, their social life changes. Uh, you know, we, we, we mix better today than we used to. When I grew up, it was strictly an Indian world. I mean, all my friends were Indians. All, all everybody, everything I did was Indian. It was in the Indian community, uh, and even at that time, it still wasn't a good idea for an Indian guy like me to have a, a white girlfriend at Elgin. I mean, that was still frowned upon. Uh, even though, you know, among us, we had no animosities, but the adult people still didn't think that was the right thing to happen. Uh, and so now that, that's pretty much all gone away. Uh, American Indians marry into every race now. And <laughs> their, uh, their uh, uh, status then takes them to another level where uh, I think the mindset uh, of the younger generation today uh, there, there isn't the same as going to a church like Church of the Servant where my children went for a while where they have all those activities and all those youth programs and all those kind of things that a young person can do versus going to Angie Smith United Methodist Church where there's nothing. So the choice then for them pretty obvious. And so you lose that segment who maybe do have a little bit more uh, financial capability for helping a church. But I've never changed. You know, I, I, I've, I have nothing against Church of the Servant. I have nothing against St. Luke's United Methodist Church. Matter of fact, I do a lot of uh, classes for St. Luke's in their adult programs. But my heart is in the missionary conference. Uh, I like to hear the music. Uh, I don't know whether there's a, 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 a debate about formality, but I'm comfortable in the pew I sit in, or the ch church I go to, where I don't know whether I'd be that comfortable in St. Luke's or a church. Or, now, I'm not afraid to go there, you know. I mean, I don't, I don't have, I don't have uh, uh, less respect or, for myself or, or less confidence in myself about anything we do. Uh, I can compare myself to most of those people who go to those churches. And it's not that I don't like them, <laughs> or it's not that they're bad, or it's not that there's anything bad there. 
I mean, I'm a, I'm a person who believes otherwise, and I enjoy myself being among the Indian people. But you might have already answered my next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> uh, what do you say to people who ask, why do we need Native American churches? Why not integrate all United Methodist churches into one conference? Because of me. <laughs> I mean, they're comfortable there. I, I, I mean, in my church, other, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm being, uh, I'm being, uh, uh, I don't want this to sound like I'm judging. I'm not. But, but in reality, I'll bet you that knowing what I know uh, about those families, well, there's probably not more than four or five of us who would be comfortable in, in a, a non-Indian church or who could actually go to one if there wasn't any other choice. Now, if there wasn't any other church to go to, I would probably consider going to a place like St. Luke's or Church of the Servant, you know, because I want to be in a service to, to honor the, the Christianity relief. But uh, those people, I think, come because they're comfortable there. And so when you give them the opportunity to come and, and practice a Christian faith and learn about uh, what we, we can do as Christians and, and, uh, and satisfy themselves that their lives are worthy, uh, it serves a purpose. Now, they don't have a lot of outreach in those programs, but for the people who do come, I think it's very, very much worth it. Now, I think if my church ever ceased to exist, it'll be because of financial reasons, not anything else. But what, what have we not covered? Is there something you think about you'd like to share with us or a perspective you have that we haven't addressed? Well, you know, like everything else, it's a struggle. You know, you have to, you have to believe and you have to have faith. Uh, I know faith has always been a very important thing that's uh, uh, been presented to me from the time I've grown up, you know, uh, teaching us to have faith uh, from the time I was small to the time I am now hasn't changed. And so I think, you know, that's an important thing to, to always try to uh, maintain is, you know, to have faith in what you do and that things will be okay and uh, that God will look down upon you because you've got good faith.